How did Stuart Butterfield go from no running water or electricity to creating two of the most successful internet apps ever? I don't know anything about growing up on a commune, but I can tell you five product management lessons that led him to change the way that we... Ugh, someone is slacking me. Hold on. One trial and error. This was V1 of Flickr. It was a massive multiplayer online game called Game Never Ending. It didn't end. It was socialization without an objective. Weird. Too weird for 2002. This was a time before the first successful metaverse game launched, Second like Life, which was totally me. normal. What is happening? This feels like one of those private rooms in VR chat that I don't want to walk in on. Hi. Oh. Hi. Okay. I don't like this. Hi. <laughs> Hey. Maybe Game Never Ending wasn't weird enough. They ran out of money. Ending the game never ending. And Stuart, you found out a way to do what? A way to take the interface that we had developed for the game, which let people chat, which let right. people change locations, which let people manipulate these objects, like pull them into their inventory and do yeah. stuff with them. And instead of the objects, we'll just have photos. Butterfield did one of the most important tasks of product management. He killed a product that didn't work and found out where his innovative technology did work. He gamified photo sharing, but killed a lot of the gaming features. This is what we learned with Duolingo lingo's gamification success when you borrow features you gotta ask how do i need to modify this feature for my audience in this case people sharing photos and for you youngsters Flickr was the instagram of the 2000s and more if you had a blog a website or just wanted to share a photo online there was a good chance it was hosted on Flickr. yahoo bought Flickr because its technology changed the way that photos are shared grouped and tagged when someone tags you in an embarrassing pic online, you can thank Flickr for their patent on photos and metadata. Thanks, Flickr. Jump to 2009, Butterfield tries another play at the metaverse called Glitch, but something went wrong. It was really hard for us to get people even to go through the first few minutes of the game because it was just so different and so weird. Most people who tried it were like, what the hell is this? And just pieced out in the first three minutes of gameplay. They had a leaky bucket. Far too many left immediately and the game died. It may have been too weird for the masses, but they were incredibly productive at launching features for a small group of diehard fans who absolutely loved their work. Zuckerberg has been trying to rebuild Glitch ever since. Glitch's team was distributed and originally used IRC, an old internet relay chat system that developers were still using from the 90s. But there was a problem. Unlike messages today, if you weren't online at the exact moment that the message was sent, all communications vanished into thin air. Poof. So Stuart, what did you do? So we built the system to log the messages. But once we had the messages in the database, we wanted to be able to search them. So we built search on top of that. And slowly we developed the system, which was like the foundation of all of the ways in which the company communicated and was really beneficial. And so we realized, huh, none of us are ever going to work without something like this ever again. Other teams of eight software developers would probably like it as well. And so we decided that's what we're going to do. Turns out other people felt the same way. In just eight months, Slack became a unicorn and the fastest growing business app ever. So you want to know exactly how to replicate this success? Stuart, tell them. All right. Well, so the bad news is that um, they're close to impossible to replicate. Both are kind of uh, pivots from failed massively multiplayer games. So it's the kind of thing that I think if you started off with the intent to build a failed massively multiplayer game, you may not end up with, with a product like this. Okay, Stuart, that's not helpful. Clearly, you're not trying to sell a product manager lesson, but I am by my course on sale now. But I'll give you Butterfield's lesson here, which has been demonstrated by many great companies. And that is to have an experimental mindset and to not get too attached to your original ideas. Butterfield and his teams were able to create incredibly successful products because they listened to their users and they had the courage to let go of their original ideas when most users told them by quitting that they didn't like them. And this is a fun experience to have as a product leader, right, Stuart? We had the experience and the, the feeling was not like, well, chin up, old fellow, we're going to try again and um, it'll all be okay in the end. It was uh, like, just personally speaking, from the inside, uh, horrible. Okay, I lied. It's Horrible to have experiments fail. But as I often say, your product is not your baby. Product managers must be able to abandon failed products. And that's hard to do if you keep calling it your baby. It's an experiment, totally different. 
With Slack, the features were built and tested internally over years. Then they experimented with Slack in other companies. They quickly found some features became chaotic in larger teams, like RDO, a streaming service later acquired by Pandora. They took the feedback and said, oh, that great idea isn't so great after all made changes and started the process all over again. But you must remember that experimentation doesn't exist without two, customer empathy. Slack was one of the most customer hype products I've ever seen. You can see their Twitter wall of love if you want to know what I mean. It's weird to see so much love for a business application. I also worked at two business app startups that early users adored, and it was also weird and wonderful. But that love doesn't just magically appear. Slack's Twitter wall of love didn't start off wonderful. There was critical feedback. How did they find out that Slack was chaotic for bigger teams? They asked for feedback from everyone, even down to new hires. They knew that Slack was great for small teams like their own, but as a new hire entered a bigger company, Slack, with dozens of channels to choose from, they said, what is this chaos? So Slack immediately took that feedback and added fields for a description and the number of people using each channel. As Slack became more organized for their users, so did their intake of user feedback. Butterfield wrote, we're pretty fast, fastidious, fastidious, we're pretty fastidious about tagging all of these incoming messages, collating and entering and retaining the data that people are sending us. You might not think of qualitative feedback in quantitative ways, but Butterfield did. And so do the best product managers. Everyone talks about talking to customers, but the real battle is in gathering that customer feedback and then translating it into a language that your entire team understands. You can't just tell your engineers that a customer has feelings. Well, I'm out. I don't trust anyone. It's a huge part of my belief system. Doesn't translate. You need to gather those feelings, organize them, and translate them. Hey team, 75% of users who are new hires say the app is chaotic. If we added channel descriptions, that might prevent them from leaving. Doesn't mean that I trust her, and I certainly don't trust anyone else. Qualitative quantified. But you don't get a Twitter wall of love from quantifying tweets and feedback. Customer empathy is something much deeper at Slack, and I love how far they take their mission. And it turns out that that mission for the, like, for the product is a great mission to turn back into the company so that if all of us are continually trying to make each other's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive, then you take a little bit more care in how you communicate something. If you're going to ask someone a question, you give them a little bit more context. If you're going to call a meeting, you have some result you want out of that meeting, and you communicate it in advance so people don't come and feel like they're wasting their time. And that you know trickles down into, into everything. I love this. Stop scheduling meetings with no agenda. Have some empathy. They lived it. Empathy trickled into everything. If they ran an A-B test that showed more profit at the expense of the user, they threw it out. They spent an unsustainable amount of time personally solving customer problems at the beginning. And this absurd customer focus returned a wealth of feedback and customer solutions that would later make Slack unstoppable. We saw the same thing with Paul Graham's successful companies. And I saw this firsthand at Looker. Our founder, Lloyd Tab, said, great software is an act of empathy. We had an incredible support team called the Department of Customer Love. We were hyper-focused on the customer and customers returned the love. And that's why I don't have student loans anymore. And like Slack, we had self-empathy with a core value of time to shred. But you need to be from Santa Cruz to know what that means. For Slack, it was having genuine empathy that led to customer love on Twitter which is ironic because Twitter is a nasty cesspool of three. What's your number? Your magic number. Don't be shy. Every product manager should have one. I'm talking about key metrics here. At Duolingo, the magic number was 10. If someone used Duolingo for 10 days straight, they were straight hooked. Slack was 2,000. 2,000 messages. A team that hit 2,000 messages, that's about 10 people slacking for a week. A whopping 93% of them are still using Slack today. That is an incredibly sticky icky number. Wow. Butterfield says you have to find what your magic number is for retention because every business is different. And as soon as you find that metric, you make it a core metric for the entire company to focus on. Whether it's email reminders, finessing the UI, or gathering customer insight, 
You want everyone to focus on that magic number. My videos on Duolingo and Netflix take a deeper dive into finding your retention metric or what Butterfield calls your magic number. Four, if your product is great, it doesn't need to be good. You heard that right. If it's great, it don't need to be good. Is that what you wanted me to say? It don't need to be good. It don't need to be good. Stuart, tell me, what makes an app great? Um, it, it can be an amazing app, and if the password reset thing doesn't work, and I need to reset my password to use it, then I'm just locked out. So there's like, there's very basic fundamental things you have to get right, and which aren't the, the interesting ones. In fact, someone tweeted something the other day, which I liked, that kind of illustrates this from a different perspective. And it's someone asking Ray Kroc, the kind of founder and for CEO of McDonald's, why was McDonald's so successful? And he says, because we have clean bathrooms. The thesis here is, if you do a few things incredibly well, the rest doesn't really matter. If your product is great, it doesn't need to be good, was the title of a blog by the creator of Gmail, which Butterfield followed closely. Gmail launched with very few features, but their email organization and search was incredibly reliable. You don't need to do everything if you do just a few things really well. This was also at the core of Google search when they competed against the giant Yahoo. Less was more. Slack picked three things to get very, very right and forgot about everything else. This ruthless prioritization keeps your team focused so that they don't get distracted by shiny objects or butterflies. One was search. Like Gmail, they made it extremely easy to find conversations. Two synchronization. From the get-go, Slack focused on what's dubbed leave state synchronization, to know exactly when someone leaves the convo, exactly where they left off, to pick back up the convo on a new device seamlessly. This is actually really hard to do. And three was simple file sharing, drag and drop files with confidence. This was their clean bathroom. You might not even notice it, but if it's dirty, I'll never go back. I have one really big disagreement with you, Stuart. McDonald's bathrooms are not what they used to be. I would have gone with in and out to showcase if you have a few great things on the menu, you don't even need anything else on the menu. People wait in long lines at in and out because if you're great, you don't need to be good. Today, Burger Buff sat in the drive-thru for only eight hours. Five, bottoms up. This is the bottom up approach. Stuart. How did you know that Slack was a hard sell for executives? Here's the interesting thing. We ask our customers, um, what did you use before Slack? And 80% of them say nothing. In its early days, Slack was hard to sell because it was a category that didn't exist. And if the internal communications box on the CFO's checklist doesn't exist, what are we even talking about? So Slack focused on the end users immediately. How much is it? Seven, 25, what, thousand? $7.25? Oh, I'll just expense it. If my boss likes it, we'll keep it. Slack made it cheap enough that they could expand from the ground up. You don't need your CFO to ask for a free account or go big on the $7.25 pro membership. But if you get to expense a pro account, everyone else will want to be a cool kid too. This is product-led growth, often called PLG. It's a strategy that companies use to build products that essentially sell themselves or at least that you get to upgrade without needing to talk to a salesperson. Slack is a PLG poster child, but PLG is a super important topic for another video. So subscribe, you got this. Ah! Jesus. <laughs> Holy Jesus, baby Jesus.